Happy New Year. Hi, good Stephanie. Hey, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Good to be good to be back with you guys. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for coming back after a, a little big break over the, the holidays. Um, my name is Stephanie Barrett. For anyone who has not yet joined us on a little lunch lecture, I'm the Director of Donor Relations with the Coastal Land Trust. I'm super glad to have you at our little lunch lecture today. Um, we are recording the lecture and it's on Facebook Live. Just wanted to let you know. Um, there will be some links in the chat if you want to check out. Um, if you're not on our email list and you want to be, you can sign up. If you love Coastal Land Trust programs or just love Coastal Land Trust in general, um, we would invite you to make a donation if you'd like. Um, and a little housekeeping, we'll keep everyone on mute today. I'm kind of like on default mute, so I hope you can hear me, even though I have to wear the mask since I'm at work today. Um, but if you have a question, you can either type it into the chat or at the end, um, we'll have some time for Q&A and &A you can take yourself off of mute and ask your question at that time. Um, so on to the good stuff. Our speaker today, is Jennifer Cox. Um, Jennifer grew up near Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and she came to Wilmington and went to UNCW. Um, she worked at Port Fisher State Recreation Area and Carolina Beach State Park as seasonal worker and park ranger. But in 2001, uh, she went away from Wilmington and she has been a ranger at Jockey Bridge State Park ever since. Um, there she wears many hats. She's basically done everything there is to do there. Um, but she is currently the park's safety officer and also does education programs and prescribed burning. So how's that for like variety of things to do in a day? Um, fun fact, Jennifer and her husband have a cat named Logie who is named for the Norse god of fire and is also the name of one of Saturn's moons. So um, there's your free trivia for today. Um, and uh, Jennifer is going to talk with us today about uh, bird migration. So uh, we'll all be um, we'll all be experts after this. So Jennifer, uh, take it away. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. And um, like she said, my name is Jennifer Cox. Um, I'm going to give you my PowerPoint presentation on migration, the journey of birds. It, um, it's, got, it's kind of an overview of migration. There is a lot you can learn about migration, but I'm going to kind of basically give you the nitty gritty on it. Um, it's, a, it's not a behavior that all birds do. So just keep that in mind. Some birds don't migrate at all. Um, every single species of bird is completely different. They're pretty much masters of their own evolution and they, they adapt very well. So not all birds do this, but a lot of them still do, and um, we'll go over that some more. So I'll get started. Um, so first of all, migration, let's talk about where does the word come from? And the Latin root of that is migrare, which means to go from one place to another. So that's pretty easy um, as far as roots of words go. Um, which way do birds migrate? Most people think of your north to south and south to north. Um, but a lot of birds may go obliquely across a continent or a waterway, which is basically slanted. Some might go side to side, just do a very short migration, like they may go from the coast and inland and back out. Some may go vertical, which is also called altitudinal migration, which is up and down a mountain. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. And then there are long migrations and short migrations. And our long migration, I always think of immediately, I, the Arctic turn comes to mind. That bird goes from one pole to the next pole. So in one year, he does about, he or she does about 50,000 miles. Um, and then what I, this is kind of my own little pet term for birds that don't migrate, but I call them sedentary migrators. So I have a little fun with that one. And we'll talk a little bit more about them, but why do birds migrate? Um, that is a question that comes up a lot. They do it to enhance their chances for survival. They need more food. They need long. They want longer days for mating and and raising their young. That is a picture. That is a picture from Alice in Wonderland's 
that is a dodo bird there, which is actually extinct now. They did not migrate. They were large birds that lived off a coast in Africa. They did not wear jackets like that. This is an artist's rendering of one. They, uh, they did not become extinct due to not migrating. There were other reasons, including habitat loss. But I just wanted to, that's just a side note. I put him in there because I thought it was, he was really cute. All right, what, what causes the birds to migrate? Like what gets them started? Hormones do. There's an internal stimulus with birds. Hormones are released. The two main hormones that get them started are prolactin, which is a hormone that is, that is associated with mating and metabolism. And in mammals, it is associated with milk production. Um, corticosterone is the other hormone, and it is both of these are released by the pituitary, but corticosterone regulates energy and stress responses. So both of those hormones, once they start being released in the bird, he starts getting the urge to migrate. But what causes these hormones to become released? And that would be the photo period. And the photo period is the period of time each day a species is illuminated by light. So it's the lengthening of and shortening of the days. And their circadian rhythm has something to do with this and it gets the hormones released, which leads the birds to start to want to migrate. And the next, next slide is, has one of my favorite words on it. Because what, what do those hormones cause birds to do? Basically, it, they get this pre-migratory restlessness going on and they want to eat, they want to store fat, they're excited, they're restless, they gather in large groups, they stretch their wings and they eat as much as they can for energy. This is called hyperphagia and they make a lot of noise. And there's a German word for it and I'm not gonna pronounce it correctly, but it's still fun to pronounce or try to pronounce it. It's Zugrunaha. And you guys can look that up and try to pronounce that on your own, but I'm sure I'm not doing it right, but it's still fun. So have at it. Um, but when I see a large group of birds together going through their pre-migratory restlessness, it, to me, it's almost like a big bird party. And I know they're all getting together, getting ready to do a, a big flight. So, all right. Do they do all this all right at the beginning of migration? Um, no, they don't. They actually do it all along their migratory routes. They need staging points. These are critical. They're basically rest areas, just like humans need when we're on a long journey. They're very important along the way. And land conservation along migration routes is very important in this because they need these rest areas to, to get more food, to have the energy to continue on with their journey. Because if not, it's basically a death sentence if they can't keep eating, they can't keep flying. So do all birds go through this process? Do all birds migrate? And the short answer is no, not all birds migrate. There are, there are actually a lot of non-migratory birds. Um, they don't, some don't have the flying capability. And for example, there I have a picture of the ring-necked pheasant there. Um, he's a very fast bird. That bird will actually run up to 35 miles per hour. And then he'll fly straight up in the air when he's spooked, but um, he's not a good migrator. They were actually introduced in, in most continents. So you'll find them most anywhere, but they're not migrators. They, they can, um, they'll eat, they find stuff to eat all year round. So they've adapted to their habitats very well. So they don't need to. So, and a lot of birds don't have, just don't have the drive to migrate. They just simply do not need to. Um, their food supply and habitat is sufficient for their needs. Um, great horned owls, screech owls, barred owls, a lot of them stay in the same area. Uh, some birds stay and defend their territories, like their um, mating territories. Some are just hardy. Um, the mockingbirds, jays, northern cardinals, crows, they've learned to adapt to their habitats also. Right. So migratory patterns, they're not fixed. Patterns and roots can change as the earth changes. Human development, sea level rise, a new lake, uh, restored land, or, or a myriad of other factors can play a role in their migratory patterns. It's an exceptionally old habit. It's older than the last glacial epoch when the climate was much different than it was today. 
So birds, they, they may change if they find a new route to go along where they can find an area where they can do the hyperphagia and eat a lot more, then they may alter their route just a little bit. And they can remember that from year to year. They're definitely better travelers and map readers than I am. So are some birds better suited for migrating than others? And the short answer is absolutely yes. Um, long, birds that have long migrations tend to be lighter and have, have uh, more streamlined wings and the, compared to structurally compared to like the ringneck pheasant. That's an Arctic tern is the top bird there. And that's the one I was talking about that goes 50,000 miles circumpolar circumnavigates the entire globe. You see he has very streamlined wind, wings and he's actually a very light bird. The one below him is a sooty shearwater and you will find him, he he's, will be offshore some usually where there's some upwelling in the ocean and they nest far down off the South American coast. Um, so they, they do a long migration also. So, okay, do birds, do they migrate during the day or night? And the answer is both. Night migrants um, tend to be secretive birds that rails and woodcocks, they're very secretive and they, they'll migrate at night. They prefer to get their journey done by the cloak of night. And also a lot of small insect eating birds, such as the Carolina wren that we see there. Um, they will eat their insects during the day and rest during the day, and then they'll migrate a lot at night. Uh, large groups of birds can actually show up on radars at night during migration, and that's pretty neat to see. You can actually sometimes see them like on weather.gov on the weather on radios, radars, I'm sorry, you can see them. And you can hear them. Sometimes if you walk outside in the middle of night, you may hear a whole bunch of birds or chattering, um, and that's a, a lot of time in the spring and fall. And they tend to be very noisy when they're doing this. And some of these calls are only heard during migration. You won't hear them if they're just in your yard, um, singing to each other, communicating with each other. It may be a different call than what you hear when they're actually migrating. So most of the flying is done by midnight and then they rest and then they have the whole day to forage and prepare for the next leg of the trip um, for the next night. And that's night migrants. Well, what about day migrants? And day migrants tend to be uh, birds that can eat on the fly, such as hawks, eagles, and cranes. They also tend to be comparably very strong flyers, such as the hummingbirds. And the hummingbirds can be, a you could do a whole hour talk on hummingbirds. They are amazing birds, fantastic migrators. They definitely deserve a lot of studies and be recognized. And I would actually like to say all birds do. Migration is an incredible thing, incredible behavior to study. My personal favorite, the cedar waxwing, tends to do a fairly short migration. And I like, I'm glad I brought them up because they were actually in my yard yesterday morning. I only see them once a year and they, they finally moved through. I've been watching for them. I've been hearing people report them all over North Carolina. And I was just every day, I'm like, where are they? And finally yesterday they moved through and ate all the ber berries off my tree. So or do any birds migrate during the day and night? And and the answer is yes. Herons and gulls will do gulls will do day and night, and um, there's several other birds too. So, if we talked about the hormones that are released during the photo period, but what about external influencers of the migration journey? And it's basically weather is your external influence, and weather can make or break a journey for birds. Um, sometimes it can provide a tailwind to help them along, or it may ground or hinder them. And sometimes if it's too extreme, it could prove, um, prove to be fatal for them. Clouds can also influence them too. And they have found that some birds will fly below the clouds, some will fly through and some of above. Um, and rain and fronts can influence that sometime. And oh, my cat promised he wouldn't come through here, but he did, so. All right, and reverse and retreat migration is where they may retreat from a strong front or an air mass. Once the weather subsides, they can reorient themselves and continue on. And this is more common in the fall when there's harsh winter weather forming. And then I had mentioned vertical migration. 
that one's a neat one. And vertical or altitudinal migration is when a bird moves up and down a mountain. It's more common in the West where you have the very tall mountains. And a personal story is I was doing a lot of hiking in Oregon about 10 years ago. And I am used to the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains. I had no idea what I was about to experience, but it only took a couple hundred feet of walking up and down a trail on a mountain out there. And you need to wear layers. I shed layers and I put layers back on. So it's amazing how you just go up a couple of feet and it's a harsh environment. And then you go down and it's like a tropical rainforest. So the birds are gonna to react to that and move up and down a mountain. Um, they'll descend into the valleys and lower slopes where the, where the weather is milder and the food's more plentiful if the top of the mountain becomes too harsh and then they can go back up as the harsh weather moves off. So uh, uh, when I talk about migration with children, a lot of them like to ask how fast they can go. And that really depends on the bird and each species is completely different. And two examples I have up there on the screen is the ruddy turnstone and the peregrine falcon. And the ruddy turnstone, sorry, ruddy turnstone was recorded an average of 649 miles per day at 27 miles per hour. Um, so he, he was booking and they had a peregrine falcon. They didn't have his actual speed, but he, he um, was recorded in 1965 on a 9,000 mile journey for his species. So they're doing a lot of miles each day. Let's see, do they use familiar routes? And this, this is about flyways. And they do use familiar routes of travel. Um, most birds go back and forth to the same wintering and nesting spots, but they may use different routes. But it's difficult to prove for sure unless we have a tracker on each bird. And if they get blown off course a little bit, they can reorient themselves. There's been some studies on that. They use narrow corridors called flyways. And I have an example of North America up there, but there are flyways all over the globe. It's not just North America. So there, I didn't want you guys to think that birds only do this in North America. There are four main ones that go through North America that are shown in the example here. And we fly, we, we fly, we fall in the Eastern one going down the East Coast. Ours is called the Atlantic Flyway. And I'll actually start on the left there to name them. And we have the Pacific Flyway is green. The central flyway, that's the one that the sandhill cranes are famous for. And that's um, the one in, it's the orangish pinkish color. And you have the Mississippi flyway and then the Atlantic flyway. A lot of these, if you notice, if you're familiar with the geography of North America, they're following basically geographic structures like the Mississippi ones basically fall on the Mississippi River. So how do they find their way and stay together? And as mentioned before, we talked about language and calls, and they do, they have these calls that you, that you can't hear any other time, that you don't hear any other time. So that helps them to stay in contact and keep together. So keeping up with each other and together are one thing, but as a group, finding their way can involve a lot of other factors. And orientation is taking up a direction, and navigation is the ability to maintain a direction. Both of these skills are needed to help these birds find their way. And what do they use to find their way? The first thing we'll talk about is the sun. And there have been many fascinating experiments performed to learn how birds use these different tools. The sun compass was proved by German scientist Gustav Kramer, and he performed an experiment in 1954 using starlings. And what he did was he used mirrors to trick them into thinking the sun was in a different direction than it actually was. And they adjusted themselves accordingly. So he, from out of that, he figured out that they were following the sun. And the sun compass, they also have a circadian rhythm and it ties back into the photo period I talked about, the lengthening or the shortening of the days. And it helps them to, to figure out where the sun is in the sky compared to what time of day it is so they know which way to travel. But the sun is not the only tool in their toolbox that they use. 
Fran Sawyer, a, a German ornithologist, added on to Kramer's work by proving that they also use the stars. And he studied birds in outdoor cages that would maintain their restlessness, their zagumraha, <laughs> in the direction that they would migrate after the sunset using visible stars. So once it clouded over, the birds would then circle the cage or stop altogether because they couldn't see the stars. So they were just like, okay, well, let's just rest here until we know our way again and then continue on our journey. But they were in cages, so he, 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 they weren't going anywhere so he could study them. So as far as other things in the sky goes, the moon is the next thing. And the moon, the, the aspect of the moon is still being studied, but they, it seems to hinder orientation more than help it. The light reflected off of the surface can create a glare that obscures the star patterns. So there's, a, there's no substitute for the persistence of the sun compass or the star patterns. So the moon, they have seen birds eating by the moonlight. And as we all know, sometimes a full moon, you can walk out in your yard and it's like daylight. So they may continue on with some of their daytime habits um, or behaviors during the night when there's a full moon. But as far as migrating goes, so the moon doesn't really help them along. They're not following it. So that's the celestial objects. What about the earth objects and landmarks? But they, they do, do use a lot of landmarks. There are a lot of landmarks that birds use, including rivers, coastlines, lakes, mountain river, mountain ridges, and prairies. And just like with other animals, um, one bird's barrier is another bird's flyway. Some birds will not cross certain geographic structures or um, topography, and um, some birds follow it. So. so as I mentioned before, there are still a lot of studies being done on migration to better understand it, and they're continuing to study even more. They study a lot about the Earth's magnetism. They think that birds use magnetic reception, mag I'm saying that wrong, magnetic reception, which is they're using the magnetism of the Earth to, to find their way along migration, and also smell maps or olfactory maps where they're smelling their way. And they there's been a lot of experiments done where the they're finding birds can actually smell their way over oceans and waterways too. They know the different smells of the waters. So all in all, they do not rely on simply one of these tools to find their way. They probably use, or they, they may use a combination of one, two, or all of them, probably all of them. Um, some species prefer one over the other, and, um, but they do use all of the tools at some point. So some other useful vocabulary for talking about migration is migrational hom homing, which refers to the return to the same place. It's usually their birthplace, which is very common with ducks. Range is the total area they are seen all year. And this can change over time. They don't read maps in bird books. I have to tell people that a lot. I, in fact, earlier, I looked up ringneck pheasant because I'm, I was just curious what the range map said, and it doesn't even show them in North Carolina, but I know they're here because I've seen them. So birds don't read the maps in the bird books. So you can't always re rely on that, but they're good guides. Eruption, and this is when you have an irregular migration. It's usually due to a circumstance such as a food scarcity. And this is what has recently brought the snowy owl to the Outer Banks, which was just about two weeks ago. And when I worked at Fort Fisher, we had the snowy owl came there a couple of times also. And that was due to eruption. And then there's dispersal, which living on the East Coast, the, you, this happens a lot with birds and like hurricanes will throw a bird off its course. Let's see. All right, the last few slides, basically we're gonna just kind of go over a little bit of it. This is a black-bellied plover here. And notice he has very streamlined wings. And he's, a, he's not the smallest plover, he's a pretty large plover, but he does migrate. He winters up in Arctic Alaska and Canada, 
And he comes down here and he puts on that fancy outfit when he's here on our coast, on the East Coast, to um, for his uh, breeding plumage. And I, I think they I think they look really fancy in the summer. I like their breeding plumage. Uh, the ringneck pheasant. Oh no. Sorry. There's actually nobody here. I think he's just barking. But so the ringneck pheasant, he does not migrate. They were introduced on most continents um, for hunting. I think they came from Eurasia, but they do not migrate. They're very large birds with comparably small wings compared to the rest of their body. See, and that's what it talks about on that slide. All right. So when does migration occur? And factors are to consider are um, species, distance, route. Um, and it basically happens all year round because it really depends on the species. Like I said, some of them don't migrate at all. And some, they, they all live in different types of habitats. So some need, might need to leave their area a little bit earlier than birds in, per se, North Carolina need to leave. All right, and some, some birds travel long distances over um, bodies of water. And earlier I mentioned the, the hummingbirds. This is a ruby-throated thre hummingbird here. And this is what, what I mainly get, my feeders here in the summertime. And they travel incredible distance distances over waters sometimes 500 miles and more. The, there's a picture of the Arctic Tern is in the upper right-hand corner there. That's the one. Basically, if there was a Westminster show for birds instead of dogs, I think the Arctic Tern would get the best in show. So he, because he's just a fantastic migrator. And then we have the curlews and wimbrels. Those are the the curlews. I always have to look. The, the curlews on the bottom there and the wimbrels up on, on the top. And they do five to 6,000 miles nonstop. So they, um, they have huge migration routes also. So in conclusion, bird migrations is still being studied. Like I mentioned, um, they're constantly changing and we learn a lot from them. And they may even be changing routes due to events that we are not aware of due to change in habitats. So I would, I know it's cliche, but the birds migrating could be a canary in the coal mine for us to let us know about something that we don't even realize that's going on. So it is important to pay attention to migrating birds and find out why, if they change their migration route, why um, it could teach us something we didn't know. Um, but that is all I have for you guys today. And I'll hand it back over to Stephanie and I hope you guys learned something or had a good review at least. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. That is, uh, it's a great uh, introduction to me to many of those uh, vocabulary words. I don't, I didn't know them, and I didn't know the terms. Some things that um, I might have heard about before. So thank you. I I do invite anybody who has a question. Oh, we do have a question in the chat. Um, Jeannie wants to know where do they rest when they are migrating over an ocean or a body of water. A lot of birds that migrate over water, like the sheer waters and stuff, are already pelagic birds. Um, so they may, they just rest on the water. There's actually a lot of, it, there's different, just really depends on the species. One of the issues they have with some birds is they're attracted to the lights of ships that are offshore. And when they're migrating, they, they see that as basically a beacon of a place to rest. But then when they get there, it's just a ship which they can rest on, but there's no food. So sometimes that can prove fatal to a bird. Um, and I actually know people who work on ships that are spotters so that record which type of birds come to their ships. And um, so that kind of helps scientists give them some information. But also there, there's a few islands that they'll know about along the route where they can get food. So it really just depends on the species, but there's, um, there's it, some, we think of vast, large open bodies of water. There, there are floating, um, you know, the floating seaweeds and stuff that they can rest on and get food from. So there's a, a lot, of, there's some different options for them out there. Um, uh, how, how do the birds determine the leader? 
Um, I would think if they're migrating in a group, how do they determine the leader? You know, I'm not sure of that question, but I do, this is kind of, this is kind of a, they're, sometimes they fly in a V formation. And this is just a joke. So you guys, I'm, I'm a just side onto a joke here. When they fly in a, a V formation, sometimes there's more birds on one side than the other. And if anybody knows why they do that, they can answer it and answer. But um, basically, it's just because there's more birds in that one side. <laughs> I think I told that joke wrong, but <laughs> you get my drift. Um, I'm not sure they, I think they just as a group kind of have a collective memory. A lot of the older birds usually migrate first and find their way. And I think the smaller one or the younger ones may follow behind them because they still need to learn it. A lot of it's instinctual, but they still have to memorize these maps as they go along. So a lot of the older birds basically trial and error. They actually did a study with some birds when they're trying to figure out if they reorient themselves and they put a group, I, I want to say it was cat birds up there on the peninsula in Maryland. And they came down the peninsula realized they didn't want to cross over the Chesapeake Bay area. It was too large of a body of water for them. So they retreated, went back up the peninsula and back down it. And they're not sure how they actually knew that. It's just, it was so instinctual. Um, so that's where I think the smell maps or the olfactory maps come in. And that would be just pure memorization from the older birds. Cool. Um, Lachlan wants to know if penguins migrate. I'm not sure. I'll look that up right now. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm not going to have penguins in this book here. I don't think they migrate. No, they they might, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not totally sure because there's several different species of penguins. They may go from one side of their area to another depending on the fish. I guess <laughs> I would have to look that one up and get back to you because since they're not in our area, I don't do a lot of penguin studies. <laughs> Fair enough. Maybe maybe that's one for Google. Yes. <laughs> uh, another question is how long have birds been migrating? Is that millions of years or few or more, more or less than millions of years? Um, they say since the, it's a behavior as old as the last glacial, my, glacial epic, which I believe was like 150,000 years ago. It's, and that's when the weather was a whole lot harsher than it is now. And that's why some birds, um, like cardinals, there are some cardinals that might go from Virginia to South Carolina and then back up, but a lot of them will just hang out in North Carolina. There's no need for them to migrate anymore. But when the weather was harsher, they would need to for, for survival reasons to find more food. But um, I have to look up the last glacial epic. epic. I believe it was 150,000 years ago. I, I may be wrong on that. Okay. I don't have that one written in my, my notes. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, do you know the longest they stay up in the air without come um, without a rest stop? I I'm not sure about that one. Um, so it just depends on the species. Like a hummingbird. Hummingbirds, they say they can go like 500 miles um, over some water areas, so they stay up there for a while. There's a lot of different studies on hummingbirds and. From what I understand, they're one of the ones that stay up in the air for quite a long time. Lots of questions today. I'm going to keep going until you cut me off. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> like I gave most of my knowledge was in the PowerPoint presentation. So. <laughs> no, you're doing great. You're earning a whole new batch for your um, outfit. Um, <laughs> if there is a Wilson's Warbler here at a, one of our local parks. Um, and the question is, do you think he would survive the winter here or is he gonna migrate somewhere? They, well, I would need to look at that specific warbler up. I know there, there's a thing like with hummingbirds, you need to take in the food at a certain point so that they are forced to go migrate because a lot of time, like especially up in my area is a little different than Wilmington, it's a little bit warmer down there. You want them to migrate to go find food. So you don't want to keep feeding them or they'll just keep staying. Um, I would have to look up the specific Wilson's warbler. 
if it just depends on the weather, if you have a mild winter, he may not need to go anywhere. He may be fine if he has a food source, but if the winter gets harsh, then, you know, that, that could prove fatal, but it just really depends on his food source and if he can find shelter. And final question, um, do you think that bird migration paths are being changed by climate change? Personally, <laughs> um, uh, climate change is changing a lot of things. Um, and, and I believe including bird migration, because if, if an area gets inundated with water and there's no longer a field for them to eat on, then they're gonna have to move to a different area to find that food, so yeah. And, and like if we create a new lake, like by, by damming up a river, the birds may come to that area. Um, so yeah, any type of changes like that and climate change is a huge change. Um, the birds will alter and, and they'll figure it out. They, they'll, they'll figure out where their food is. Fair enough. Jeannie, do you have our, our, our last question? Yes. I, I, understand that they want to go south for warmer weather but the last in that last set of slides you showed one that I thought it said went north in the winter and I just wondered why would a bird want to go where it's colder in the winter what if were you talking about there was one I think I misspoke on I remember as soon as I changed this slide I thought I had misspoke or is I talking about the wimb or not the wimbrel it was, was the it the city sheer water set of pictures I think it was a white bird in the last set. And I thought it said on there that it wanted to go north in the winter. I just thought that was odd. Was it the Arctic turn? Maybe. Was it that the bird in the top, top right there? Probably, yes. That's the Arctic turn, and he actually goes from, I, you may have heard me say North Pole to South Pole and back to the North again. He, he will go from one pole to the other, so it's like he flies from one cold place to another cold place and back. He's our best in show bird. Um, he goes all the way around the world and uses both sides of the globe, too. It's pretty incredible. That is amazing. That is awesome. Um, and there's a bunch of people saying thank you um, for a great lecture, Jennifer. We do appreciate it. Um, I would like to mention before everybody signs off that we have um, we have a little lunch lecture scheduled for the 29th of January. Um, this this is about Bird Island. Uh, Lauren Colodi from the Coastal Federation talk with us about um, Bird Island um, and the conservation partnership. Um, we don't currently have a, a lecture scheduled for next Friday, um, but I am working on that. So just keep your eyes on the, the website and email. Um, and if you have any suggestions or somebody you heard or would love to hear more about on a topic, um, I heard somebody say in the chat um, their interest is piqued about hummingbirds and so maybe one yes. we can get um soon but uh feel free to just email me um i would love to have your suggestions of stuff you want to hear about um and let's see i think that's about it i did want to mention that um our on our blog on our website uh tom Earnhardt is a, a beautiful uh naturalist and photographer um who has been sending us um reflections and photo essays basically for this entire time during um quarantine and covid days and he but in december he actually wrote a really cool blog that talks about migrating birds on in eastern north carolina so um that might you might want to go check that out just because some of the things that you heard here um, are mentioned in that blog as well. And then there's also some really cool additional photos of giant groups of birds who are doing their migrating thing here in Eastern North Carolina. So um, let me see, I, I don't know that I can get that link for you right this instant, but um, it's called, it's on our blog. And so you can just look through there um, and find it. It's from December, it's called Bright Stars. Um, 
but yeah, I think that's about all we have for today, but another thank you to Jennifer um, for sharing your expertise and sharing your time with us today. And um, we'll see everybody um, hopefully next Friday, but if not, 29th. So y'all take care. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Yep. Goodbye. Thanks, Jen. Good to see you. You too. Bye.